sort of useful or interesting to people. So I want to just introduce some of the methods that. Um, start. Looks like, yes. <laughs> Don't oversell it. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did I did I do that? Word <laughs> now. Okay. Um, so some of the methods that I use for uh, parameter estimation and that can be used for model tuning and uh, uncertainty quantification. Um, and yeah, I'll just dive right in. So let's say you have some uh, model, a weather model, a climate model, and you want to improve it with observations. Maybe it has some free parameters, some coefficients in there that are poorly estimated, that have some uncertainty to them. Um, and then you have some observations, and you want those observations to help you, right? So you might want to do something like uh, find what, what uh, parameter values are best by some uh, quantitative metric. So maybe you compare to your observations, you run a, a, a simulation, you run a forecast, and you compare to your observations. And you kind of use that to sort of turn the knobs in your model and, and figure out what, your, uh, what parameter values are best. OK, uh, let's say you want to do sensitivity analysis. You just want to figure out uh, which of these knobs has the biggest impact or what sort of impact it has on your um, model behavior. Uh, or maybe you want to do uh, uncertainty quantification. You want to get some measure of, uh, in your model, those parameters, how bad are they? How, uh, how, how little do you know about them? Or how little do the observations inform them? Um, so for any of these things, um, you, can, uh, you can do the stuff that I'm going to talk about, um, maybe, depending on your problem. Um, and basically, the way that it's usually posed is as a, um, as a probabilistic um, problem. Uh, so what's the most probable set of parameter values, given all the information that you have? So all the information that you have might be um, some knowledge you have, uh, some prior knowledge you have about what the parameter value should be. Maybe it's from theory, maybe it's from empirical studies, uh, maybe there's some expert guess. Uh, you also might have a model, right? You might have some dynamical model that helps you um, take those parameter values and make a forecast, and then you can compare your forecast to the observations. So I actually didn't write that in there, but that is a crucial component of this. And uh, combining it like this, you can express it probabilistically. So what you say is, I want to find the probability of some parameter value x, and that's a, some vector of parameters, of coefficients, uh, given some new data or information, y. So what's the probability of x given y? That's a conditional probability. And, uh, and then Bayes' theorem tells us how to solve this. So it's uh, the, pr the probability of x given y is given by uh, this, which is your prior. Uh, so it's the probability of x, just any prior information you have about that. Uh, and then this is called the likelihood. And um, that basically is a measure of your mismatch when you run your model um, between your observations, your new data, and your forecast. So uh, if you like, I can. That you can define this in in various ways, but usually you consider the mismatch between your observations and your model forecast, and you also consider any observational uncertainties that you have. And you can also add in model uncertainties. Uh, so that's an important term. This isn't that important of a term. You, we can just ignore that for now. It's just a normalizing factor uh, for parameter estimation. So as I said, prior PDF, and then that's uh, likelihood of observations given parameter values. And then uh, here I've put M, where I'm just using M to denote uh, your model. So everything's kind of conditional on the model. Uh, when you're running one of these exercises, it all depends on what your model is, and the result that you get will change depending on what model you use. So a uh, parameter that you estimate in, in one climate model will not necessarily translate to another due to various compensating errors and whatnot. Um, and possibly because of uh, different structure of each model, right? Maybe the, the, the coefficients are named the same, but the actual way in which the model uses them is different. <coughs> so uh, there's no need to, to know what that is, but basically there are ways of solving this sort of automatically. Um, the simplest way might be to just consider your parameter space, right? So I have, say, some, uh, some parameter space that I want to estimate. I'm just going to look all over in my parameter space. I'm going to take all of the parameter values everywhere, run my model, compare to the observations, and see which areas are best. So here's a really simple example. Uh, let's say I want to fit a Gaussian to a few points. Right? So this is obviously just a, a very simple, it's not even a, a model of any sort. 
Well, our model is that there's a Gaussian distribution and that these points fit that distribution. So what's the best Gaussian that fits this? Well, we might consider that um, there's different values of the, the mean value of that Gaussian and different values <coughs> of the variance of that Gaussian. Right? So this sort of defines your two-dimensional parameter space. And each of these you can consider uh, that there is some, uh, that, uh, I'm sorry, this defines uh, the Gaussian at each point, right, that you would get, the normal distribution at each point. So you compare that to the data and see which matches the data best. And uh, this is kind of a way of visualizing that these ones have higher probability than the other ones. And so you find what region of your parameter space is the highest probability, which regions have lower, and which regions have the lowest or negligible probability. All right, so this, uh, this would work for basically any case. It's really easy to code. It's really simple to, to, to consider this. Um, but there's no real way to do this uh, efficiently or, uh, or adequately for, um, for a parameter space, especially if you have lots of dimensions. Right? So searching around in a two-dimensional space is really easy. Let's say you have 20 parameters or even just 10 parameters. To try to, to, to um, search in that sort of 20-dimensional space becomes extremely expensive. Right? It's the curse of dimensionality. So in general, in our climate models, we have just buckets of parameters that we want to estimate, and they're all correlated, and they all affect the same things. So this is never going to work. Um, Mark we need, yeah? How do you define probability? So is it, is it like room and square difference? Data. So uh, usually the way that you do it is that you consider that your observations have some uncertainty. So, right. So I get my observation value, and then uh, there's some probability that defines um, where the true value is. So given that I have this observation, the true value could be anywhere in here, but following this probability, right? And then you get your model. Right, this is maybe your model forecast, and so that defines your probability. Right. And so if your model produces something closer to your observation, then that has a higher probability. And that's usually, usually you do that, uh, you assume that there's some Gaussian probability, or some Gaussian uncertainty, and so that would look like, um, mismatch between your model and your observations uh, divided by your variance, by your standard deviation. Yeah, but those are <coughs> factors. You have more observations. What's that? Y you have uh, a number of observations. Yeah. So this is sort of a, this is a sum over. All yeah, the so then, uh, so if, if you want to do this multivariate, then it just becomes a multivariate Gaussian. Right, so this becomes, this would be a vector, and then you would have, um, where this is a vector, this is a vector. Uh, you have a covariance matrix for your, instead of uh, a standard deviation. Um, sorry, I'm running over things. It basically would be that, uh, it would be that. So it's, it's just, it, so there's analogous formation if you have a multivariate case and you could have correlated errors or this uh, covariance matrix could be diagonal. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Does this uh, depend uh, significantly on the fact that the observations have a Gaussian distribution? If they have a difference because many physical fields, for example, this at the temperature and the ocean is definitely not Gaussian. So, I mean, you can, you, this, is, this is a little bit of an easier part, or uh, one part where you can more easily define a non-Gaussian <coughs> structure. So you can just uh, define this based on a log normal probability instead, and, and that should work. Uh, there are some methods which more stringently enforce Gaussianity or, or rely more closely on Gaussianity, so like ensemble Kalman filters, mm -hmm. for example, do, or a lot of optimal estimation methods do as well. So in those cases, then um, you have to like talk to you know data simulation super geniuses who have invented uh, 
non-Gaussian filters that are kind of complicated. But in, in this step, just defining the likelihood, defining this mismatch, you can define it any way you want, really, and, and using any probability distribution for your observational uncertainty that you want, as long as you can you know, write it out. Okay, so uh, in any case, just like going through the parameter space and searching is, is not feasible when you have a lot of uh, parameters. So uh, you could do something like common filter. Uh, so, so if you assume that all of your probabilities are Gaussian and your model is linear, uh, so in other words, that your model can be expressed as a matrix, so you know, not climate models and not weather <laughs> models, basically. Uh, Bayes' theorem is trivial to solve, so it just becomes, uh, this is, it doesn't matter what this means, it's a bunch of linear algebra. You just solve a bunch of linear algebra and you get your, uh, your most likely value for your quantities of interest and the uh, Gaussian uncertainty. That's a product of, um, <coughs> of basically your, your model and uh, any prior uncertainties you have and your observational uncertainties. So it just comes out of the linear algebra. It's really easy to solve. Um, uh, people use this anyways for, uh, for climate and weather models, of course. Um, so uh, you use an ensemble approximation uh, to basically model your, your model response. So instead of having a linear model, you just run your model and you pretend that it's linear. You pretend that the response is linear. And that's the uh, ensemble common filter. So uh, for strongly linear, nonlinear problems, basically all the ones that we deal with, and especially parameter estimation problems, uh, these approximations are really bad. So there's a few papers, uh, Derek Passelt has worked on this a little bit um, and shown basically how bad it is. There are actually some, some new developments in nonlinear non filters which um, tend to work better for some of these problems. Is model error buried in R and the observational error? <coughs> I think you can bury it there, yeah. To be honest, I haven't looked at this in ages, so I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you can bury it there. Yeah. In terms of where, um, yeah. Uh, usually it's, hmm. it's a good question. It's been a long time since I've looked at this stuff, sorry. Okay, so uh, instead the, the methodology that I tend to use is uh, called Markov Chain Monte Carlo. And basically that approach is to uh, intelligently sample the parameter space. Well, maybe intelligently is a little bit uh, too strong of a word. It's, it's basically a random walk. So you do a random walk through your parameter space, through your multi-dimensional parameter space. And uh, let's see, so the random walk can be Gaussian or uniform, that doesn't really matter. <coughs> um, each new sample depends only on the previous sample. So like a very inebriated person, uh, you don't remember two steps before you, you only remember the last step that you took. Uh, and basically what you do is you take a step, take a random step, and if it's better, you stay there. And if it's worse, uh, maybe you stay there and maybe you step back. And then you take another random step. And you just keep on doing this process. Um, and basically what's special about this is that um, is that the density of samples, so as you're moving around this space, the density of the points that you're moving around in actually perfectly matches the probability that, you're, that you want to um, estimate. And the way that you do that is that each time you, you step to a new place, you compare your, your forecast using these new parameters versus your observations. And then that's how you determine whether to stay or to move. So let me just show that. So let's say that this is uh, the probability that we want to estimate. We have no idea what it is. This is sitting out somewhere in nature, and we have no idea exactly what that is, but we want to estimate it uh, through MCMC. So what we do is, let's say we just pick a point. So we pick a point, we run our model, and we get the probability of that, uh, of that model um, realization. All right, and then we do this step again. We take a step. And then we find a point, and the point has higher probabilities, so we keep that point. And then we do the next step, so that was accepted. And you can see that we're starting to get a little chain of uh, results here. So we take another step, and this has lower probability. So we look, we basically take the ratio of these two probabilities, 
and that's the probability with which we accept this new step. And in this case, we rejected it. So then we just double up on that previous point. And you just keep on doing this process, basically. So maybe you accept the next point. And basically, it, it looks something like this. And um, I don't know if this will actually play. Oh, shoot. All right, well, that's a close play. Sorry. So basically, uh, you get a bunch of dots, and then the density of those dots become is the probability that you're trying to estimate. Um, so, and you can do that in, in multi-dimensional spaces, and it doesn't matter whether that uh, probability is Gaussian or non-Gaussian, uh, it works fine. Okay, so there are some big problems with MCMC. There's basically no efficient way to <coughs> parallelize it. Um, because it's a random walk, it's it's entirely dependent on that chain. You can't just like split up those different samples um, amongst different processors or something. Okay, uh, the big one is really that it requires zillions of samples. So uh, for like a 10 dimensional case, you probably want to run at least a million samples. So that means uh, drawing a million different parameter values and running your model each time and comparing it to the observations. So it's kind of not feasible for a lot of uh, models. And uh, we really have to accurately have an accurate prior and have accurate observational uncertainty if you want to have a good um, estimate of the, what the real probability of your parameters is. So this is sort of garbage in, garbage out. If you give it something that's biased, then you'll get a biased result. Um, and Another big one is that uh, if, you're, if you're doing one of these parameter estimation experiments in general, um, you're kind of making an implicit assumption that the parameters of interest are the main sources of uncertainty in your problem. And so if there are other leading order uh, sources of uncertainty, then those, uh, that uncertainty will become convolved in your parameter uncertainty and those estimates of parameter uncertainty and the estimates of the parameters themselves uh, will not necessarily be reliable or meaningful in any that's kind of a tricky one also. All right, uh, bottom line is that they're good for really tough problems that are like nonlinear. Um, if you have a multimodal problem, so in other words, uh, non-unique solutions, uh, they work where other methods don't work. Um, but your model basically has to be cheap, and even then you have to be really careful um, about how you design the problem. All right, so uh, if you just want to know what the best value is, so I should, I should mention that one of the big benefits of MCMC is that you don't just get the optimal value, you also get um, the full uncertainty of that and any correlations between uh, parameter values as well, uh, which is nice. If all you want is the optimal value, uh, you can modify MCMC slightly to do uh, simulated annealing, which basically it does the same thing, but uh, at first, it'll take really crazy steps and keep on moving around the parameter space. And as time goes on, it'll get more conservative and only take steps that are leading it to higher probability. How long do you have to run the model for each of those? Uh, for MCMC? Yeah. Um, it depends. I mean, as long as you feel is necessary for the model to reach some state where you feel comfortable comparing it to the observations. You're asking about running the model, not doing the sampling, right? Yeah, running the model. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, at whatever point you feel good about comparing it to observations, basically. So, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's, that's, one, that's a, a, a case where, or a point where the expert guidance of the problem is really important. So, um, you know, that's going to vary problem to problem. Okay, so simulate annealing. Um, let me just skip forward. Basically what it does is, let's say you have some probability distribution. It starts out by flattening that probability distribution so that it can move around it more easily. And then as time goes on, it gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And you can actually end up with a state where it's more narrow than the original distribution. So that's basically only gonna sit on the highest probability point of your distribution. 
So at first it explores very wildly to find any, uh, any um, optimal points, and then it gets more and more conservative to find only the best point. All right, I'm not going to talk about Gibbs sampling. Uh, there's like a zillion different varieties of these things for different problems. Uh, the MCMC hammer, they have cool names. The no U-turn <laughs> sampler, uh, you know. Uh, there's also, you can reframe the MCMC as a filter, and that's when people talk about particle filters. That's basically just uh, doing a filtering problem rather than a smoothing problem. So there's a, there's a ton of these methods. Okay, uh, now this is a big thing. Uh, what if your model is still too expensive and you can only afford to run it a few times? So here, what you might do is uh, emulate the response of your model to some perturbation of parameters using some sort of nonlinear regression. So basically, you simplify your model, you replace your model with a model surrogate that, uh, that maps those parameter perturbations onto some response. And then you do your parameter estimation or sensitivity analysis or uncertainty quantification on your cheap model rather than your extremely expensive model. And that first step involves another set of model integrations. Yeah, so you do Which have to, big. yeah. Um, Relative to the cheap ones that are. It's like order of 100 or, or oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so probably around 500, 1,000 times. Oh, okay. Yeah. It depends on the problem, and um, it probably, what it also will depend upon is um, how, how ill-behaved your, your model is. So if your model is very linear and, and uh, responds very smoothly to parameter perturbations, then you could get away with doing very few uh, original samples of your parameter space. But if it has like sharp transitions and uh, strong nonlinearities, then you probably want to do a more thorough initial sampling. Okay, so there's a few different techniques, Gaussian process models, uh, polynomial chaos expansions, uh, but they all basically do the same thing. You replace your big model, big expensive model, with, uh, with a cheap surrogate. And so let's say yeah, this, is, uh, your, this is a target uh, distribution. So this is sort of the real parameter PDF. So here we have five parameters, um, and the, it has two high probability spots in it. So this must be a nonlinear model um, where we have two different distinct regions in the parameter space which give us good results uh, by comparison to the observations. Um, by the way, I estimated this using uh, MCMC uh, with about 500,000 samples. So this is motivated by a case that uh, Greg and I are working on, uh, Greg Alcester where basically he looked at a parameter space and found uh, with comparison to the observations that there are two distinct regions that provided reasonable results. And so the problem is that <coughs> if you optimize, you only find one of those. Um, so we, what we wanted to do is really explore um, both and map out multiple possible solutions uh, for the climate model. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the real thing. And then uh, you can do a Gaussian process uh, emulator for it. And uh, it looks pretty junky, but it does get some really important features. So it gets that there are uh, two modes. It gets their relative location right. And the, the probabilities are you know, roughly comparable. It can't get how narrow this one is in real life, but um, it does this with only 500 samples. So you've basically uh, improved <coughs> the efficiency of the sampling methodology uh, by a factor of a thousand. And uh, depending on what your goal is, and our goal is just to find multiple modes in this parameter space, uh, this might be sufficient. It also might be sufficient if you're looking at you know, first or second order sensitivities <laughs> of your model parameters. Oops, sorry, I have a question. Yep. So the, the choices, are they like the Gaussian process model, like that's the simplified model that you're building in step one here. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you don't need like an adjoint or something like that. <laughs> no. Step. Okay. No. Yeah. 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 yeah um, I guess it's it's in some ways it's analogous to an adjoint, okay. um, yeah, yeah. but it's constructed very differently. Sorry. Can you say again from the from this doing the initial model runs from which you built an emulator? Mm -hmm. So like a hundred or so. Model simulations? 
Yeah, so in this case it was 500. 500 model runs mm -hmm. with how many parameters? Five. Five. Yep. And then you built your em emulator, and then the previous slide was were 500,000. That was mapping out the probability of the parameter space using the full model. So in other words, the, using the exact model, using the, the true model, yeah. the full model, um, I ran that 500,000 times. Okay. Oops. And then uh, using the approximate model that was mm -hmm. constructed with only 500 uh, model runs. Okay. This is what the parameter space looks like. So actually what I did was then I ran uh, MCMC on the surrogate model yeah. many thousands of times. But that's cheap right? yeah. with comparison to the full model. Um, so depending on uh, what sort of accuracy you need, this might be good enough. You probably don't want to replace your entire climate model with uh, an emulator, but uh, for these sort of experiments, it might be good enough. Uh, here's another thing that I did. I, I ran simulated annealing on this case to try to find these different modes. So these little <coughs> red stars are the sort of final position of a uh, simulated annealing chain to try to find the optimal points. Now specifically trying to find multiple modes here and not just the global minimum or the global maximum probability. So I think one or two, I, I ran this 10 times and one or two of the simulated annealing runs found the second mode and the rest found the main mode. And that took about 500 uh, iterations of the model. So doing something like this is also more expensive than doing the emulator typically. And this is, uh, yeah. So this is a simulated annealing that I tailored specifically to finding multiple modes. Okay. All right. Uh, so I'm I'm going to move on to some examples of stuff that I've I've used these methods for. Uh, so here's one case. Uh, this is an ice cloud. So this is an ice cloud observed um, in the Arctic, and. Uh, Basically, uh, particles, ice particles are falling and growing. And here, they're sort of pristine crystals, and here they're aggregates, so they're complex crystals. Um, what I did was, well, what I did was, I looked at this region where they're just uh, pristine crystals, and tried to estimate the parameters of the crystal growth. So, working with some people at Penn State, um, <coughs> Jerry Harrington and, and Matt Cumgen. They have a model that models the, the growth of, of ice crystals. Um, but there are free parameters in that model that they'd like to estimate, and they'd like to use observations to estimate those. So looking at this region where we're just getting dendrites, this is, by the way, this is reflectivity, and this is differential reflectivity. So differential reflectivity is when you uh, use radar reflectivity with two polarizations, and you compare the horizontal and the vertical polarization. Um, and comparing the backscatter from each polarization gives you some sense of whether a particle is uh, horizontally aligned and oblate, or whether it's vertically aligned, or whether it's kind of roughly spherical. So ZDR will be higher when you have a, um, a horizontally aligned uh, particle, like a snowflake falling. Okay, so you can look at sort of profiles of these things. So this is reflectivity. Reflectivity increases. Uh, just look at the blue line. Reflectivity increases. Uh, ZDR kind of stays high at some level. Um, anyway, so we want to match these observations. And uh, by perturbing the model parameters and running this, uh, doing this with uh, MCMC, uh, we can get a good matchup of the model behavior and get an estimate of what the model parameters should be. So these sort of darker regions are the higher probability regions of the parameter space. This is a parameter that controls um, basically whether an ice crystal, just draw. So let's say that this is your ice crystal. This is kind of looking sideways at it. Uh, that first parameter controls whether it grows along this axis or this axis form. Um, and then these parameters, there are two parameters that control basically the density of ice that accretes onto this ice particle, so how dense that is. So we're able to, to estimate them. We get some sense of the uncertainty in them. 
and we get a reasonable match up to observations with our model. So that's one little example. How do you start your, um, what's your initial guess? We used a, uh, well, so the initial guess was just basically a uh, prior range. So just, um, we don't assume that there's any peak in the probability, it's just a uniform probability. It's basically the default that you do when you have no idea what the parameter value should be. Just stick a min and a max and then see what, what ends up in there. <coughs> yep. Do you, do you match with all the observations once or do you save some of them to truth test whether or not your model, have, you have any confidence in your model on an area that you didn't design it for? You should definitely do the latter. This was just a, a test. Um, but yeah, you should definitely do that. So uh, we have another experiment where we're, where we're basically, uh, yeah, we use, we use multiple, simu multiple simulations of rain, and then we estimate the parameters, and we compare for some independent set of, of simulations. You should definitely do the latter rather than this. This was just to show people in a proposal that we could actually do this. Do, do, I mean, do, do any of those techniques turn out to do, I mean, is it, do you end up over-tuning with certain techniques? I mean, are certain techniques more Definitely. to be flexible that scenarios are not designed? I think I think the overtuning comes in when you don't consider all sources of observation or sources of uncertainty in both the model and the observations. Um, and I think that's probably the hardest thing to do. Um, but yeah, you can do you can definitely overtune. Um, Okay, uh, so here's another example. Um, here, this is some in situ observations of ice at different levels. So this is high up in a cloud and lower down in a cloud. And basically, this is a case where ice is falling and sticking together. And so we want to estimate basically um, the, the microphysics of how those particles stick, the sticking efficiency. Um, so using sort of these observations, using observations of what the particles look like in terms of uh, how the area of the particle varies with size, um, and also using radar. So this is radar uh, looking upwards, looking at different times, and this is reflectivity, and this is the fall speed. So basically, as these things are clumping together, the fall speed increases. As these things are clumping together, the reflectivity increases. The radar backscatter, in other words, increases. So using uh, these information, combining all these sources of information, we can try to constrain the parameter values. Uh, so this is a sticking parameter, and then these are all uh, parameters <coughs> involved with uh, the ice properties and also the ice size distribution. And then we get some matchup to our observation, uh, which works reasonably well. So there's another example, similar problem. <coughs> uh, here's another case where we're uh, developing a new uh, microphysics scheme. That's uh, basically the idea is to sort of throw out all of the old microphysics schemes where we assume a particle size distribution and start fresh with one that doesn't assume those things. So this particular version has 30 parameters. This is just to show that we can actually constrain the value of some of these parameter parameters of the model. Uh, actually, some of them are very poorly constrained, so that's a little worry. And then uh, we basically run that model and compare to a bunch of different observations to see uh, how well it does. So this is an example where it's an independent uh, set of simulations that we compare. And here, in general, we get good results. And the important thing here, I think, is that when you take the probabilistic approach, you can get an envelope of solutions, which tells you about your forecast uncertainty. So in general, in cases where we have bad matchup to, so this, the blue is the observation, the red is the model, and the black lines are the model. I'm sorry, the red is actually the observation. In cases where you have a bad matchup, you also have more uncertainty predicted. In cases where you have a better matchup, you have less uncertainty predicted. So that's kind of what you want in a probabilistic forecast system. So, so we can ignore these comments here. So I guess I was just thinking back to your like previous figure with the 30. So when you're running like this the Monte Carlo, is it, is it going through kind of like all the parameters at once or are you holding one constant, or are you holding them like all except for one constant and then sampling that it, one? It takes it takes a fully multi-dimensional step each time. Okay. So like in the end, do you get one do you get one like this is uh, like this is my n-dimensional uh, what am I trying to say? 
So it's somewhere it had like this is what I want the values for every single one of those to be to have the most highest yeah. probability of yeah. The so you get a value. So it's it's actually really hard to summarize the information that you or the, the full information that you can get out of this um, because there's no way to visualize a thirty dimensional uh, density. Um, and basically, the way that you show it, I showed it here is by integrating across all dimensions but two, and uh, that hides a lot of features. So, I mean. I would say the, the most that you can really get out of it is you can get a, uh, a best estimate, you can get uncertainty. Okay. However you want to define that uncertainty as a covariance, as a, as a variance. But, but it gives you that for all the parameters though, right? All yeah. of them. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, you, so from this you could calculate a, a 30 by 30 covariance matrix that gives you the uncertainty of the parameters in that full 30 dimensional space. Cool. But like right. on that point, sorry. No, you're no. um, if you wanted to privilege some parameters over others, if you knew some were better constrained than others, how would you go about doing that? So you, you, could, you could do that by, I mean, so in this case, all of these parameters uh, have uh, bounded uniform as the prior. You could start some parameters with a, uh, a Gaussian. So that's, a, that's an easy way to add information. Actually, in, in uh, this example, there's actually two other MCMC steps that I do beforehand to provide the prior for this experiment. So that's a case where I, I basically did one thing, got a prior, then plugged it into the next stage of the experiment, and got another prior and plugged it into a, a more compli complicated case of the experiment to sort of build up the information that you're getting from observation <coughs> step by step. What are you using? Like, what program language are you using to do this? The MCMC is in, uh, I have it coded in Fortran, but you can find Python routines. Uh, so the, the two previous steps on this one, I did in Python. So there's uh, PyMC, what is it, PyMCMC. There's also uh, EMC is another one that implements the MCMC hammer. So there's, there's, some, there's a couple of different packages and they are well documented and they work pretty well and they're easy to set up. So if anyone's interested, I can send you like a, a uh, Python workbook <coughs> that shows just a simple problem. It's it's super easy, super quick to, to set up. Yeah. Okay. So like always, you have a set of observations, and there's a ver variability in that observations, and the variability is not uncertainty, but it's just variability because of the clouds vary. Um, and now I have a model, and I run the model um, like it's it's a domain and so on. So I want that model to also I don't want it to catch the the, the mean of the observations, but also the variability. Is that yeah. is that <coughs> is that something that this also targets, or is that if I have a model that gets the mean really well, but with uh, with no variability, and I have a model which gets the mean equally well, or maybe not, but gets the variability mm -hmm. very well. I would like that model that gets the variability. Yeah. So is that, do you get that out of? Yeah, so I would say that not necessarily. So you have to make sure that you are accurately quantifying your sources of uncertainty. And one of those sources of uncertainty might be some, some stochastic element that doesn't, that's not represented in the model or some, some variables that are not um, perturbed in your model. So if you're just, let's say you're just perturbing some microphysics quantities and not some other variables which are ill-constrained but definitely affect the evolution of real clouds. Or, uh, or maybe it's some other aspect of the cloud system that's poorly represented in your model. Then you'll get, uh, you'll get a, a solution which converges on some, converges closely on something but doesn't actually span the real variability because you haven't given it the ability to. Uh, let me think of a better way to say that. Um, I think it, it really depends on, on putting in all of the sources of uncertainty that you can think of, that you can think of to quantify in your system. Uh, and if you don't, then um, you'll basically get the wrong answer because you're not spanning that space that affects the clouds in real life. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's, a really, it's a really tricky problem, and I think it's, it's not just enough to quantify the observational uncertainties. Yeah. 
it's necessary to quantify the, the model uncertainties or the uncertainties inherent in your comparison of the model to the observations. Um, and that's extremely difficult to do. So if you're, for example, I sometimes compare a 1D or a 2D model to a real observation and there's a uncertainty that's associated with, with using that 1D or 2D approximation. But how do you quantify that? I think that's, uh, that's an open question. Mm -hmm. But you need to in order to get the right answer. Yeah. Yeah. And to get the right spread, so that your spread matches your actual spread and observed cloud quantities. Mm -hmm. <coughs> And uh, how, for example, do you go about the fact that the, the parameters that you might be, uh, let's say, um, identifying, the parameter values that you might be identifying using uh, the Monte Carlo method um, uh, as appropriate, as the best, let's say, for your simulation, are in fact the ones that would be applicable for, let's say, different era or a different a climate change scenario or uh, other conditions. Presumably for different cases like that you would always have to redo. Yeah, I mean I think ideally you want to you want to estimate them with as many different situations as possible so that you you capture that in your constraint on the parameters. So that's why I was asking before how long does your in initial simulation where you do you take into the, the parameters when you build the parameters for how long does it have to be? Presumably it has to be you know, like a full pre-industrial to present and future climate or something like that, right? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, the important thing is to capture all of the important sensitivities of the model <coughs> to those parameter perturbations. So you might only get a, a sensitivity of a certain perturbation in a certain condition, right? So if you have some way of, of parsing that out so that you do, say, I do this short simulation that targets this sensitivity, this short simulation that targets this sensitivity, um, then maybe that works. But you know, there, there's still questions with that because you know, uh, maybe this case happens five times as often as this case. Mm -hmm. So if you constrain with five uh, simulations of this case that's more likely and only <laughs> one of the other. Mm -hmm. So this is where, this is where I, 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 I had one bullet that just mentioned passing that expert guidance is necessary. And this is where it's like you can't just hand this off to, to somebody to run this stuff. It has to be with all of the, the knowledge and intuition of, of the modeler and also of the observationalist to, to provide the necessary parts, or else it'll just go off the rails and give you garbage. <coughs> okay, uh, well, I'll wrap this up. Um, we're also doing some cloud property retrieval using radar. This is something that Jasmine Remyard and uh, Derek Passelt and I are working on. Uh, I won't talk about this that much, except to say that uh, these probability distributions are really crazy. They're really weird looking. So you have these weird shapes here. It's not really Gaussian at all. You have these like little turny structures. Uh, you have this very sharp probability line and then this strange cloud of low probability. So these are things that are basically a nightmare for standard methods to, to find. If you're just doing a, a, a plain old optimization, optimal analysis, uh, ENKF, some Gaussian method, they're going to fail miserably on this. What, um, kind of, what kind of properties are those? These are uh, cloud particle, cloud drop size distribution for a cloud mode and a drizzle mode. So this is basically estimating these parameters for a case where you have drizzle and cloud at the same time. Basically, if, if we're shooting radars at these things, can we get these parameter values back? So uh, this is a case where, because of strong nonlinearities in the problem, uh, you really need some fancy method like MCMC to get a reasonable result. I haven't tried running like an emulator on this. I don't know how well it would work um, because of some of these the nastiness of these distributions. Okay, uh, I don't think I'm going to talk about this. This is a crazy slide. This is a this is I will talk about this. It'll be the last <coughs> thing I talk about. I promise. So this is looking at sensitivity to parameter perturbation. Basically, I, I did an MCMC experiment with uh, some cloud mic physical parameters, and then I wanted to look at how perturbing those parameters affected um, certain processes within the model. So I was perturbing some parameter here, and then I was looking at the response of some process. So it makes this cloud right here. It's a little cloud. So basically, as I'm 
uh, I should mention that I'm not just perturbing this parameter, I'm perturbing 12 others as well. So this is simultaneously perturbing this parameter and other parameters. So it's not entirely clear whether this sort of cloud of response is due to perturbation of this parameter or perturbation of this parameter together with some other parameters. So I wanted to look at that and I basically broke it up by looking at um, other parameters at the same time. So along this line is a second parameter being varied while this parameter varies. So this is sort of some way of looking at a two-dimensional sensitivity of model response. And for most of them, they look kind of the same. Uh, but this one's actually interesting. So perturbing this other parameter affects the relationship between the first parameter and the model response. So here you can see that it's a lower slope, and here the slope becomes higher as this parameter gets perturbed. So this is a case where you can kind of investigate uh, multivariate. If you have this, uh, if you have one of these MCMC ensembles, you can uh, then later interrogate that ensemble to figure out multivariate sensitivities and basically how perturbing two parameters at the same time can affect model response. So you can play around. I, I know this. I, I've kind of inadequately explained this, but uh, there are ways to really dig into this rich ensemble information, so, so to pull out uh, insights about your model working. And with that, that's it. Thanks for listening.